I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report Direct Message for Thursday, July 8th, 2021. As I like to do up top, a quick reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel, tap that notification bell, and do me a different favor this time. I know I like to ask a lot of favors of you guys and you usually come through for me, but I spoke to our YouTube uh, contact and I was saying how I get all of these emails and people tweeting at me all the time and Facebook messages of people that are subscribed to our channel and don't see our videos in their feed or they're never alerted of our videos, et cetera, et cetera. And they always want the actual name of the YouTube account. So if you are watching this on YouTube and you wanna comment in the YouTube section, whether you're seeing our videos, whether you're subscribed, whether you've tapped the notification bell, whatever, whatever information you can give us, I can then send that to our YouTube person and maybe they can figure out why it is that YouTube isn't showing a certain amount of our subscribers these videos. I can't imagine why, but perhaps with the right evidence, we might be able to figure it out. All right, guys, we are doing a Q&A today. We got a ton of questions at rubenreport.locals.com. But before we get to all of that, I'm gonna be doing a story on Joy Reid. She's completely insane. She's a host over at MSNBC, which is sort of a mental institution of a uh, cable news network. And, uh, and then we're gonna get to some questions and they're a good mix. We've got some politics, some culture, some personal, some other stuff. So we're gonna do all that. But before we do, I wanna talk to you about Bonner Private Wine. I've got a Malbec in my hand right now. If you're a health conscious red wine lover like me, here's how to make your next drink 10 times healthier. Down in Argentina, they make this really dark red wine from Malbec grapes grown at 9,000 feet. They've lab tested these wines and found that they contain up to 10 times the levels of, lo of longevity and heart healthy nutrient called resveratrol. Resveratrol is powerful stuff. It pops up again and again in studies on longevity, heart health, and brain health. These wines also have 90% less sugar, fewer chemicals, fewer additives. Plus, if you love steak and BBQ like I do, red wine has been shown to actually make red meat healthier. But the best thing about these wines is that they taste great with notes of blackberry, leather, cherry, and smoke. I mean, it truly is darker, just interesting to look at, if nothing else. Today, the guys at freethinkerwine.com are giving you 50% off their best Malbecs, and you will also get 50% off shipping. Wine makes a great gift, even if it's just a gift to yourself. Just visit freethinkerwine.com today. That's freethinkerwine.com. And now back to me. All right, let's talk about Joy Reid. You know, this goes to my sort of ethical philosophical debate of how often do we have to talk about the crazy people, right? I, you know, I'm interested in building things. I wanna talk about uh, good ideas, the right ideas. I wanna talk about how we get out of this mess. And yet there is this huge segment of society that is obsessed with race and critical race theory, and they're obsessed with Marxism and communism and all the bad time-tested ideas of generations. And on one hand, it's like we should just let them be, let them have what they've got, and just ignore them, right? Like, I think there's a real argument there. And then on the other hand, we need to sort of expose them because we don't want them to continue to brainwash people, and we need to have the tools, right, uh, so that we can combat their bad ideas. And also, their bad ideas are constantly ideas that are encroaching on us, right? Like if I was in charge of the world, I'm not and I don't want to be, but if I was in charge of the world, I would be setting up a system that basically just keeps everybody sort of independent of each other. You figure out what associations you want to have and you can't just have other people's stuff and you can't brainwash other people's children and things like that. The problem is that these guys, it's not that they want to be left alone, they want to control everybody. So we got a real problem here. So I had to show you this clip of Joy Reid. I mean, this woman really is bananas. And Chris Rufo, who obviously I mention on the show quite often, great lawyer who's been one of the lead, uh, I would say, proponents of the, uh, of the basically the destruction of critical race theory, because it does feel like it's on the ropes a little bit right now. Um, he's been on her show and, and really handed it to her a week or two ago. Uh, but now they're going deeper. They're going deeper because they know they've sort of been exposed. Like, I think that the average person who's paying attention to this stuff is starting to realize that critical race theory is racist, right? The idea that, you know, a white kid just born white is somehow evil, right? And that these things, I mean, we talk about this all the time, but that these things that we know are good, that like are objectively good things, like being on time, working hard, 
knowing basic truths like two plus two equals four, et cetera, et cetera, that these are somehow tools of white supremacy, right? And that the founding of America was evil. Okay, you guys get all that stuff already at this point. Well, I think we've done such a nice job exposing some of this nonsense that people like Joy Reid, who are trying to inject this into the system, who are trying to brainwash our children, who are trying to burn the whole thing down, who are not proud to be Americans, I don't know what they're doing here at this point, uh, they're going deeper. It's not just about critical race theory anymore. Now we've got to link it to QAnon and white supremacy in a deeper way and Trump and everything else. Take a look. Because Republicans aren't running an election. They're waging an all out war for power that increasingly is based on and steeped in the Trump cult and even white nationalism. And no matter how reckless and dangerous that is, they're doing it, believing it will move white voters. Look no further than the ongoing hysteria over race conscious education, what they are shamelessly and falsely misrepresenting as critical race theory. Radicalized parent activists across the country are targeting school boards with behind the scenes help from conservative groups. Protesters are swarming those meetings, vowing to revolt against a curriculum they've labeled unacceptable and reverse racist. And leading the charge in this fight is, you guessed it, right wing media. Yesterday, Fox News mentioned critical race theory more than 100 times before two, before 1 p.m., before 2 p.m., I should say. All right, so just to be clear, I mean, Joy Reid is a racist, right? She's just an anti-white racist. Um, I don't think that's reverse racism. If you don't like people because of the color of their skin, you're a racist. She's a racist. All right, so let's just put that aside. Um, she says something that's quite extraordinary there. Radicalized parents are targeting school boards. Radicalized parents? Parents who actually want to be involved in their children's education, who want to make sure that we teach things like equality and a fair assessment of history. Their new line here is that somehow conservatives and Trump people and white supremacists and QAnon people, that they don't want any sort of honest assessment of America to be taught, that we don't want anything taught about race or the history of America or slavery or anything like that. Complete nonsense, lies absolute lies, okay? It's just crazy. The idea that it's radicalized parents targeting school boards, these are parents who are trying to de-radicalize the schools. But she knows that, and all she's got is her echo chamber of lies. And the tough part of this is, so now I can say that about her, and it's like, all right, do I sway anybody? I know that you guys make sense of it, but but now it's sort of, it's sort of on you, right? Like, if you have a friend that is watching Joy Reid, like, should you be slipping medication in their drink in the morning? You know, that might be one way of dealing with it. Should we be institutionalizing these people? Like, what do we, what do we really do about it? Now, I get it, not a lot of people are watching MSNBC, and that's sort of why they're more hysterical all of the time. But this is a serious problem. She, of course, call, refers to it as the Trump cult and white nationalism. I just wanna go on the record as saying one more time, I went to many Trump rallies. I never met a white nationalist. I never met a racist. There were gay flags. There were flags of every country. There were Jews and Muslims and Christians and Latinos and blacks and basically everybody there. It, were, it was a group of people that was pretty much just sick of the swamp and sick of the system. All these people have are these ridiculous labels of calling the rest of us white supremacists and everything else. Please show me the leader in America of the white supremacist movement, right? Like really show me that person. Who is the person that wants white people to have special treatment, white people to have special laws? Now there are plenty of people that want black people to have those things. Those are the critical race theorists, much like Joy Reid. But it simply does not exist. I think you could make a very solid argument that white Christians in America are probably the least racist people possibly in the history of the world. Right, as a majority of this country, they have, uh, I don't wanna say allowed, it's not, it's allowed isn't even the fair word. They have, they have helped build a country and sustain the ideas that have allowed everyone to come here and everyone still wants to come. And as I always say, nobody wants to leave. Notice Joy doesn't wanna go anywhere, right? Like if it's so terrible, why don't you guys get going? I will start a GoFundMe. Progressives to leave America with a parting gift. Like, let's raise a couple million bucks. I will do it, I will do it. Anyway, it's dangerous stuff and we have to keep exposing it. I, I sort of just see no way around it. 
before we get to the Q&A, guys, I want to talk to you guys about StartMail. You know, data breaches are at an all-time high as hackers become more advanced in their cybersecurity attacks, although Joe Biden did tell Putin there are 16 or 12 things that he's not allowed to attack. But besides that, you can do what you got to do, Vlad. Uh, and email possesses the highest risk to identify theft and credit card fraud, among other life-altering scams. Today, hackers can access, sell, or compromise anything from your business plans to your medical records, which is why we need to be concerned about our data breaches. Without proper email protection, just one data breach could change your life. That's why I suggest you use Startmail. Startmail keeps your email private, period. Every email can be encrypted or protected with a password, which means hackers and big tech can't read, scan, analyze, or sell your personal information ever. When you delete an email in Startmail, it's gone forever. Another reason to feel safe using Startmail is because it's backed by the world's most robust privacy laws. And Startmail uses their own servers, not Amazon's, which means they can't be put out of business like Parler. You also get unlimited anonymous alias addresses. Let's say you need pri to provide an email to a company but want to protect your identity. Startmail can generate a shareable alias email and they can be deleted at any time. As you know, I'm always saying that we should be building alternatives to what big tech is currently offering, which is why I respect how Startmail supports my privacy values and will support yours too. Start securing your email privacy with Startmail. Sign up today and you'll get 50% off your first year. Go to startmail.com slash Ruben. That's startmail with a T, S-T-A-R-T, mail.com slash Ruben for 50% off your first year. Startmail.com slash Ruben. And now back to me. All right, rubenreport.locals.com, Q&A. You sent in a lot of questions. Phoenix selected them for us. He's our intern. I said, pick good ones. And I believe that's what he's done. Here we go. Alexa says, as a teacher, how do I combat the CRT narrative when I'm surrounded by blue and on in California? Well, I would have two answers here. One would be if you were in a decent state like Florida or Texas or Tennessee, and then one is if you're in a place like New York or California, it's much more difficult. So you are here in California. First off, good luck with everything. Um, and secondly, uh, what, what can you do? Well, look, I would say you have to fight it at every level possible. If you are being handed curriculum from the teachers unions or from the principal of your school or the department head or whoever it is, and they're handing you stuff and they're saying, teach this to the kids. Teach the kids that the 1619 project is really what the founding of America is all about, not 1776. Uh, that race is the most important thing. That certain people have privilege based on their race and the color of their skin and their gender and that family doesn't matter, the nuclear family doesn't matter, and that empirical facts don't matter, and all of those things. And that, that if you get some, a question wrong, but you're of a certain color, you should still get a good grade. All of the nonsense that is being injected into the system, right? I don't have to tell you. You're a teacher, you know it. It's like, you have to decide whether you want to teach it or not. And I, and I hate to say it, but maybe you don't want to teach it. Like, I would say you have to fight it. Like, you have to, because if you are a teacher, and you know it's the wrong thing to teach and you still do it, it's like, at the end of the day, like what are you as a human? And I don't mean that to you specifically, but what are, what are any of us if we all just go along with the lies, right? Like what, what are we as people? Like we're all just on the slow descent to hell together, and I guess it's nice that we're on the ride together, but the end of this ride ain't good. So I would say if you're a teacher and you're be hand, being handed this stuff, push back against the administration as much as possible. And if it becomes untenable, I mean, if they mob you, if they threaten you, whatever, if they suspend you, whatever it is, I would say look for another job. So I'm guessing that you're a public school teacher, but find some private schools or some charter schools that you could apply at. And there are some better ones. By the way, if you're in California, there's not a ton of them. I, I have many, many friends with kids that are at elite schools here that are being completely infected by this stuff too. So that it's not an easy answer. And I get it, it kind of sucks. It's like nobody wants to be the person that's standing up. But, but maybe you do actually at the end of the day, right? Like at the end of life. Like maybe you do want to be the guy that was like, yeah, I, I said enough is enough. Uh, Giselle says, I have a 17 year old that is unsure what to do after graduation and I'm torn about how to guide her. What advice would you give a high school student about their future? You know, I get this question often when I go to colleges or I do other events where there's high school students, whatever it might be. Um, look, I think there is some utility to college. Like I look back fondly 
on my college experience. I, I, got, I went to SUNY Binghamton, State University of New York at Binghamton. It's a, it's a pretty solid SUNY school, pretty solid public school, okay? Um, now that was 20 something years ago, so I know actually that it's been infected by the social justice stuff and everything else. But I did get a pretty decent education, I would say there. Probably not great, and I, prob I definitely could have worked harder, and I probably smoked too much pot and played too, much, too many video games and all that stuff. But I think there is a utility of college, meaning getting a more robust uh, set of ideas, hopefully, if you're at a decent school, and really more than anything else, the socialization part, like that there should be some period of life between, say, when you're in high school living with your parents and you, you don't have like a, a vitally important job, you know, maybe you have an after school job, something like that, and then to the point where you're now an adult and you've got a mortgage and a car and a spouse and a dog and all the responsibilities of life. Like, I think there is something to say, but hey, between, you know, 17 and 20 or something like that, we're gonna do something. You're, you should have some experience in life away from your family with, while you're still maybe dependent a little bit, but also figuring out who you are and what you wanna do and all those things. So all that being said, look, I, first off, I don't know how you could ever send a kid to a public school at this point, meaning a public college, right? And again, I went to State University of New York. This was funded by the state and it, it was relatively cheap as far as colleges go. I think I've told you this, before I wanted to go to Syracuse because I wanted to be in sports broadcasting. At the time, I think it was about 25 grand a year. Um, now it's something like 60 grand a year, which is absolutely insane. My dad said, hey, if you go to a state school here, which they were closer to like eight grand, we'll pay for it. But if you wanna go to a, a private school, you're gonna have to pay for the difference. And I, I made the decision that I made and I didn't walk out with debt and then it, it helped me going forward. Um, I don't know that any kid should go to college at this point. You know, uh, I really don't. Um, I, I, you're gonna get brainwashed. You're gonna be mobbed. Like if you're an independent thinker, all of that stuff's gonna happen. I would say the more important thing to do is really like try to, I don't know how you do this exactly as a 17 year old, but if, but if you really tried to think about your life, like what kind of person do you wanna be? What, what work do you wanna do? Like what, what is it that you enjoy doing? If you can figure out what that is, it's like, you can get an internship. You can get an internship. You can get a low paying job somewhere. Find a mentor. You know, I talk about this in, in chapter nine of Don't Burn This Book. Um, my experience with Jordan Peterson, now I was an adult at that point and it was sort of an, an accidental mentorship because we just happened to be touring together. But like find someone who's modeling a, a life and a, and a, a career that, that's something that you could aspire to. Um, re look, you have extraordinary power right now if you're a young person to like reach out to people that mean something to you. Like there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's ways to message people. Where 20 years ago, if you, if you liked an author or you liked the, uh, whatever it might be, you know, an engineer or something, it's like you had a very limited way of getting in touch with them. Like there's ways to do it now. So, I, and, then, and then maybe because they're 17, like, I don't know, maybe like go away for a year, like do a year in Europe or, or something like, in just another town, something like that. And by the way, I, of course, I would put one little caveat to all of this, which would be that there are some things you have to go to school for, say doctors, engineers, scientists. Now we know, unfortunately, that social justice is infecting all of the STEM, uh, the STEM disciplines as well, so there's an issue there for sure. Uh, but I'm not, saying, I'm not saying none of it has any worth. Um, but if you're going just so that you can you know, major in you know, feminist, lesbian, badminton, then maybe there's a better way to spend your money and spend your time. No offense to uh, feminist badminton players. Uh, have you and David, this is from Kelly, uh, always seen eye to eye politically, have his beliefs and views coincided with your awakening over the years? You know, I've talked about this once or twice. We've sort of evolved together. He was definitely a lefty too, and we were working together when I was on the Young Turks and you know, we, yeah, we were sort of similar in that regard. We didn't talk about politics that much in our private lives. Like there's other things we liked, like food and life and music and having a good time. Um, so we were, you know, I was always sort of political and he was just kind of along the ride on that. But I will tell you this, that I, when we lived in New York City, we've been together now 10 years. When we lived in New York City, um, he had never had a credit card. Like he didn't, he didn't like believe that you would ever spend money that you didn't have. Like that was something that his dad taught him. I, I don't think he taught him not to have a credit card, but like the idea that you just don't spend money you don't have. His dad's an accountant actually, and, and, a, and a pretty great guy. And so David could not believe it. Like when I was, at the time I had some credit card debt and, and he was like, I don't, I don't understand. Why were you spending money if you didn't have it? 
and I would be like, yeah, boy, you're, you're a real conservative. You're, you know, you're fiscally conservative. So in some ways he was sort of ahead of me on that. Then I think because we've been on this voyage together and he's seen the madness of the left and the hate that I get for standing up for basic moderate principles and everything else, we have evolved pretty much together. We have some debates about some of this stuff. He actually really, the only chapter in, in Don't Burn This Book that, that I really took any sort of outside help on um, was we really, really got into it on the abortion chapter and he really did help me shift uh, some, some stuff over there. Um, and then of course, you know, just related to the abortion thing, um, you know, we are going through surrogacy right now and I've mentioned we've, it's, it's been a long uh, slog and we've, we've had some hiccups here in our, we've actually had two uh, miscarriages with our surrogate and we're, we're getting a new surrogate and I, it will work out and it's been a stressful year for everybody and all that stuff. Um, but when you go through that, not only is there just sort of the emotional toll, obviously finances, whatever, um, but you do learn about science, right? Like you do learn, oh, we've got a certain amount of embryos here and we know a day later, like they're male or female. They're not like it's male or female or other. Like you do start learning realities and it's like, oh, if a day later, after you've put the sperm and the egg together, you got the blastocyst, then you have the embryo a few days after that, it's like they can tell you if it's male or female, well, it, it is human at that point, right? We would admit that's a life if it's got a gender. Um, so some of this stuff has become very personal to us at, at the same time. And, and just, I should just say thank you. You know, I get a lot of messages like people with their sympathy and everything on the, um, on the miscarriage side. And I know a lot of people have been through it in this past year. Like a lot of people have been through it. A lot of ladies, a lot of women, and, and it goes for the husbands as well. And uh, we're just gonna keep going. Uh, Ian says, are you doing a technology free month in August? Where do you plan on going? Uh, yes, I am doing August off the grid. This will be my fifth one. No phone, no TV, no news, no current events. The one caveat to that is that I do occasionally get in my car and there's GPS right in the car and I pretty much have a horrible sense of direction. So if I'm gonna get anywhere, I will look at a screen there, but that's it. Like that really, really is it. Um, we did just book a trip. I'm gonna shut down. We're gonna be on a beach for about 10 days of it. Um, and I'm just gonna do nothing. I, I, well, I'll catch up on reading, which would be nice because you know I've traveled a lot less this last year and I used to do most of my reading on planes. Um, so I will catch up on some reading, but, but not political stuff. Actually, if you've got uh, so any nonfiction, like if you've got a good sci-fi book or just any, just not, give me some nonfiction to deal with. Uh, I will catch up on reading. Um, I'm not gonna say specifically where we're going and then we're gonna do some local travel here in California and see some friends and family. Um, but more of the month is just about like, just honestly, it's about clearing my mind. It's about not staring at that thing. I, I really think in these last five years, you know, as I've watched so many people just sort of lose their minds over politics and go crazy and be so angry all the time and really be so fundamentally different than they were a couple of years ago. I think one of the reasons that I've managed to stay sane and on the ball with a lot of this stuff is because I take this time to, to decompress. I take this time to get off the machines and not be battling in the matrix all the time, right? Not be running around and trying to kill all the agents and have all them kill me and everything else. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. We are going to do a huge live stream on July 30th where I, where I will officially announce my next book and it will go on pre-sale that day. It'll be out in April and then we've got a couple other surprises. Um, but yeah, I, can't, I really can't wait, I really can't wait. Uh, ben says a few weeks ago, Victoria's Secret went woke. As a fellow Seinfeld fan, you might know where I'm going with this. How long until the bro slash man's ear becomes a, re a real thing? So for those of you that are not Seinfeld fans, what he's referring to is that episode where Frank Costanza and Kramer, they uh, meet up with a former colleague of Frank Costanza's. I believe his name is uh, Sid Farkas. He's a bra salesman. And what Frank Costanza wants is he wants a bro or a man's ear, basically a man's bra, uh, because he's, you know, he's got a little heft in the chest area. I, we're, we're definitely making a gif of this, okay? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then all sorts of hijinks go from there. Uh, Sid Farkas then tries to make a move on Estelle Frank's wife. It's, it's a whole situation. Um, but your question is how long basically until a Victoria's Secret is making bras for men? I give it a year, I give it a year. Like panties for men, bras for men, lace panties, crotchless, the whole, all of these things, they, they just 
Wokeness, you let it in, it will destroy your company, your organization, your family, and your life. That's how it is. Sid Farkas, great reference. Marissa says there are millions being forced out of their communities because they're being priced out of the market. Given the craze in the housing market, what are your thoughts on how long it'll take for it to come back to reality? I love this question because the housing market is insane almost everywhere. So I was in Miami a couple weeks ago and I met with uh, Mayor Francis Suarez of Miami. Uh, you, I hope you guys have seen the episode already. We shot that on location in Miami Beach. And then I met with um, the mayor of Bal Harbor. Obviously, Bal Harbor is very close to Seaside where they're dealing with uh, everything that happened with that building collapse. Uh, but really, really, really great guy. And, um, and anyway, I talked to a whole bunch of people in Miami and because we're moving locals down there and my, my sister just moved down there and my brother-in-law, like talking about real estate and it's, it's absolutely crazy all over Florida, but Miami specifically. But I can tell you this, even here in Los Angeles, the market is nuts. I have a very good friend who is one of the top real estate agents in Los Angeles and she's been telling me how none of it makes sense. It actually doesn't make sense. There is so little inventory right now, even though tons of people are leaving, how the, the prices are just incredibly high right now. You put something for sale, it gets sold immediately. Now there's there's some reasons for this. You know, there was this big article written about how Blackwater is buying up all these homes and how banks are buying up homes. And you know, mortgage rates still are low, at least for now. So, you know, people can get loans more easily. Um, but this idea that basically private companies are gonna buy houses and that the, sort of the middle class will just become permanent renters is one of the most scary ideas being floated right now. You know, this sort of you will own nothing but you will be happy idea. It's a really scary thing. You know, if, I, if I've done one thing right financially over the last couple of years, it's that we went a little over our head on our first house where my old studio was. Like we stretched because I believed in owning a thing. My, my whole philosophy was if I own a physical thing, I can do additions to that thing, I can put work into that thing, and if I'm living in it, I like paying mortgage, believe it or not. Like, I don't mind paying the mortgage because interest rates are so low. To me, it's like you're just paying yourself. Like, you're, you're, yeah, you're, there's a little bit of interest there, but every month when, when I write that check or it's done electronically now, it's like, oh, I don't feel like I'm giving that money away. It's money so that I have equity in my home, which is a thing. Um, so we went over on that house, we went over on this house, and, and I believe that that's good. Like if you own a physical thing, then you can move up the ladder. So the fact that they're taking this away now from the middle class is very, is very, very dangerous. Um, and it's weird because even in a place like San Francisco where we know so many people are leaving, and as you guys know, California had the first net drop of population ever this year, and it's in the history of the state. It's like you would think the housing market would be collapsing and it's not. So this is one of those like artificial bubble situations and can it last forever? Well, usually bubbles do burst. Uh, Peter says, what was the, your favorite thing you did over the 4th of July weekend? Well, we did it, a crazy amount of grilling and I had my sister and, and my brother-in-law and their kids here and, and we had some other friends over. Um, but my favorite thing, we did an impromptu out of nowhere Saturday trip to uh, Universal Studios uh, we live about 20 minutes away from Universal and I had my six-year-old niece here, my three-year-old nephew, and we had just watched Harry Potter with my niece. We watched like three, the first three, and then we took her to Harry Potter land and we got her a wand and she got to, you know, you can, if you get the wand, you can stand on a thing and you wave your wand and some stuff happens. And we had some butter beer uh, and we went on a couple of the rides and it was just like, I've been to Universal a gajillion times because most of my family doesn't live in California. So everyone, when they come to California, they wanna do the, the uh, Universal thing, they wanna do the Disney thing. Um, you know, they've got the Transformers ride there and they just updated the Jurassic Park ride is now the Jurassic World ride and a bun bunch of other stuff. And it was just a fun day. Like, yeah, I've done the studio tour a million times and Jaws is still there. And you know, they got the, the earthquake situation with the flood. It's like, they haven't changed a lot of it in 30 years or whatever it is. Um, but you know, it's a, especially if you're, you're with kids and you can kind of see it through their eyes. And it's like, you know, watching my niece with the wand and like, oh, we were just at Hogwarts. We were just watching Hogwarts on TV last night. And now we're in the castle where you could take the tour. Uh, that, that's what it's all about. Uh, Anderson says, how, do you, how long do you think uh, Joe, <laughs> J.O. Biden, is gonna last. Um, I mean, it's the million dollar question. It's like, it's like right now we see him sputtering. 
everyone gets it, right? I don't need to belabor the point. Like even even people that won't talk about it pro uh, publicly, privately, are acknowledging something ain't right there. So the question is, can they, you know, push this thing? I mean, they've got about three years that they still need to get this guy to the end of this thing. Uh, will they have to hide him more? Will they have to drug him more? Like I don't know. I, I don't know. My guess, my just. My guess is, because it does seem significantly worse than it was even a few months ago, is that he doesn't make it the whole time, that they will announce some sort of medical thing or something like that, and Kamala will take over. That, that would be my guess, uh, but, I, but it's fairly obvious that the hope by the Biden administration or the Obama people or the Clinton people, whatever that thing is, and nobody knows what that thing is at this point, or, or very few people, I should say, know what it is, um, the hope obviously is that he gets to the end of the term and then, and then you run Kamala. Or are they just gonna sandbag her and, and put in somebody else? Who the hell knows? But I, I don't think, my gut feeling is it won't last the entire time, but who knows. Uh, Mike says there have been several states or parts of states that have been discussing secession. Do you believe it's all talk or is there a possibility that states may change their boundaries or the US might eventually s split up? You know, there is a decent amount of rumble and, and talk about this online. You know, I know that there are some cities up in the Oregon area that wanna, that wanna secede and, you know, people talk about a changing map and that the red and the blue are, are really becoming so deeply different, which as I always say, in some ways that's kind of good, that's what federalism is, but at, at some level, if the idea is, oh, we can have sort of free, you know, free market capitalist, uh, truly American states versus these sort of Marxist communist states, like what is the thing that ties us together? What is the United States part? And I don't know what that would be. So on one hand, I'm actually okay with people leaving Cali to go to Florida, and I talk about the foot vote all the time. And the other hand, it's like, if that keeps going and going and going, like what is the uniter? Like if the uniter is not the United States, if the uniter is not the Constitution, is the uniter, if the uniter is not we have some cultural identity that brings us together, then a split may be inevitable. So. It's one of those things that I don't really like talking about because I think in some ways if you talk about it, you start giving it more energy and people get that idea there and then, and then, and then it just by entropy, it almost will happen. On the other hand, maybe we do have to figure out some of this stuff because as I, as I always talk about, if we, those of you that are watching this that are somewhat like-minded, if our basic set of ideas is that we just wanna be left alone, um, that's one thing. But if their basic set of ideas is they don't want to leave us alone, that, that's really an intractable problem. Like, I don't really know what you do with that. And, and maybe, maybe a breakup is the best thing. I, it's a tough one. It's a really tough one. Uh, Tabitha says, with lo, uh, will locals be hiring for administrative, financial, and HR roles soon? Yes, absolutely. I know for sure uh, on the HR side. I don't know if the job posting is up yet, uh, but locals.com slash jobs and um, although we are really looking to hire people in Miami right now because we're opening the office there, it'll be our third office actually, we have two in Europe right now, um, we, we, you know, we're, we're willing to talk to you if you don't live in Miami just yet or if you don't live in Florida just yet. Like if you're a good engineer or you're a great administrator, you got a great financial background, uh, you're great at human resources, whatever it may be, we, we would consider it. So jobs at locals, or no, locals.com slash jobs, I should say. And, uh, and by the way, I am going to Miami this evening for a big meeting tomorrow. I can say no more. Uh, Storm says, is there any government agency that you believe is doing good or have they all corroded? Ooh, that's a good one. Is there any government agency that you believe is doing good? Well, first off, I would say there absolutely are good people who work at these agencies, right? Like I think that most of law enforcement uh, are good people. I think most of the people that are trying to protect our borders are good people. I think I, I would even take things like, you know, the Board of Education, you know, like the basic, the Department of Education, you know, like are there good people who work at the Department of Education? There's gotta be a couple good people there, right? Like I don't think they're all sort of crazed Marxists, but the, a lot of them and the, and, the, and the sort of glue that holds these things together has been infected, right? So is there any government agency you believe is doing good? Like, probably not. Well, I guess, look, we aren't being overrun by zombies at our borders, right? We've got a border problem, but like, we're not being completely overrun. So that's pretty decent. So I would say that there's, there's, there's some decent stuff there and I would always stand by the good people there. 
Um, but it may just be that the the systems in place are just too corroded. But yeah, like to me, you could blow up the Department of Education. What do, what do we need it for? Um, maybe we have to really look at the Department of Defense and see like it, it seems pretty woke right now. Like we got a problem there. Like we could probably blow up most of these things. Should we look at the Department of Energy? And it's like, are we are we really doing the right things? The Department of Transportation. I know we got Gay Pete in charge. But like, should we look at what's going on there while he's telling us that roads are racist and everything else? It's like, who knows? Uh, Janet says, any 2021 TV show or movie recommendations? You know, just last night, we watched on Amazon Prime, The Tomorrow War with Chris Pratt, and it was actually pretty decent. Movies have become so bad, and I would say almost everything on Netflix and all this stuff, because wokeism just destroys everything. It's impossible to create anything good and everything else. But we watched The Tomorrow War. It stars Chris Pratt, and I believe he directed it. Did he direct it also, Tomorrow War, Chris Pratt? I think he did. Uh, he didn't direct it, no. But he, did he co-write it? He did, or he produced it, I think. At least something, yeah. He produced it, I got a thumbs up. Um, it wasn't woke, it was sci-fi, it was futury, it was a little scary, it made you think. It wasn't the greatest movie I've ever seen, but the aliens were kind of cool and different, and it, it had like, you know, some heart pumping action in it. It was actually a movie worth watching. Uh, on television, not much. You know, we just watched the third season of The Kaminsky Method on Netflix, which was uh, Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin, really two of the greatest actors of the last like 50 years. It's three seasons. The first two seasons were spectacular. And then I'm guessing that Alan Arkin, he, I think he's like late 80s, maybe even 90 at this point. He didn't do the last season. So I don't know if it was because of COVID or some other reason didn't do it. And the show just completely derailed in the third season. But if you wanna watch just sort of like a, a sort of quick, just like a light, fun, funny show about, about aging and you know coming to terms with your life and everything else, the first two seasons of The Kaminsky Method on Netflix were quite good. Uh, last question, Candace says, do you think Trump has a real chance against those goons at Facebook, Twitter, and Google? So if you didn't see this, uh, Trump announced yesterday a class action lawsuit against Twitter, Facebook, and Google, and including some of the CEOs of those companies. I believe Zuckerberg was personally mentioned, Jack Dorsey, over at Twitter. Um, you know, I saw an interview with Alan Dershowitz, famed Harvard Law professor who's been right about most of the issues and he takes the hits for it. And he said this is the most important First Amendment case in modern times. So if Alan Dershowitz is going that deep on it, I think obviously the case has some merit. You know, there's the endless debate over Section 230 of the Communications Act, whether these are platforms or publishers, how they treat information, meaning are they censoring people? And if they are, they're not platforms, they're actual publishers, in which case they should be held liable. On the other hand, if you hold Facebook and Twitter liable for the content that's on their platforms, they, they might start censoring more. So these are not easy things to deal with. But I will say this, I think it's good. Even if Trump loses the lawsuit, the idea that there is now a legitimate class action lawsuit, and by the way, class action, that means anyone can get in on this that's using these services, right? Trump is just the lead person on the, on the suit. Well, the idea that he's gonna sue them and has some money to do it, like maybe they're gonna have to open up some of the secrets, right? Maybe they're gonna, you know, because of discovery, Twitter is gonna have to be like, oh, we did have employees, you know, looking at your direct messages. And we actually were shadow banning based on political belief. Oh, and you know, now there's suddenly some leaked emails and it turns out when we decided to blow up Trump's Twitter account, it turns out that, you know, eight of the 10 people that did it were also donating to the Biden campaign. Like, who knows? Who knows what we will find out? But the general idea of a lawsuit to get a little more accountability from these companies, even if ultimately the lawsuit loses, I think that's pretty good. But as you know, I always say, you know, probably some antitrust stuff where you break them up and more than anything else, competition, man, that is what will save us. Uh, guys, I am heading to Miami tonight. So later today, we're actually pre-taping tomorrow's uh, round table, uh, which will be a weekly recap of all of the madness uh, with Walter Kern, who I've never had on the show before, who I've wanted to have on forever, screenwriter, really brilliant guy. I do Gutfeld show with him often, and he's just like a truly unique political thinker if you don't know him, so I'm really happy we're having him on. Uh, Carlin Borisenko, who we've had on many times, she was once a lefty knitter, then she went to a Trump rally and became a complete right-wing maniac like me, who knew? Uh, and Viva Fry, one of my favorite legal experts from the uh, country formerly known as Canada that now seems to be uh, a dystopian nightmare. Uh, also guys, part two of my interview with J.D. Vance, who's running for Senate in Ohio. 
is up right now. And of course, the full episode is already up ad-free at rubenreport.locals.com. All right, I got a couple other things to do, and then I'm hopping on a plane to Miami. Maybe we'll try to do a meetup there, but it's going to be a pretty, uh, a pretty wacky trip. Uh, but if you want to at least see if there's a meetup, rubenreport.locals.com. All right, have a great day, everybody. And I'll, I'll see, well, you'll see me tomorrow. I'll see you on Monday.